and good evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this the second in the annual lecture series of the Royal Historical Society. Before uh, introducing our speaker, I'm just going to give you a few small housekeeping announcements. Firstly, this event does have closed captions, so if you'd like to see the closed captions, press on the CC button at the bottom, a live transcript CC, it says off down on the bottom right, and that will show uh, subtitles in real time for you. There is also down at the bottom here a chat function, um, and if you want to speak to your um, fellow attendees here, please do feel free to put your thoughts and ideas into that chat function. If you're unable to stay with us through to the end of the lecture, worry not, because we are recording the lecture and we will be hosting it on the RXS's website in the next few days. We will take a little pause at the end of Catherine's paper, and we have a dedicated question and answer um, channel here on the chat function. I'll remind everybody at the end of the paper, um, and we will, of course, be um, putting questions to Catherine in the second half of our event. Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Catherine Holmes. Catherine is a professor of medieval history and a fellow of University College Oxford. She's a specialist in the politics and culture of the Mediterranean and Byzantium world between the 10th and the early 15th centuries. Catherine's research began at Oxford with a PhD of the early 11th century Byzantine Emperor Basil, Basil II. And after a research fellowship at Cambridge, she returned to take up her current post at University College in 2001. Her first book, Basil II and the Governance of Empire, 976 to 1025, was published with OUP in 2005. And subsequent publications have included the edited collection Byzantines, Latins and Turks in the Eastern Mediterranean World after 1150, and together with Naomi Standen, The Global Middle Ages, uh, which was published as a past and present supplement in 2018. In addition, Catherine has performed great service for our profession and our discipline by serving as an editor for English Historical Review um, since 2011. So this evening, Catherine is speaking on the geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean between the late 10th and the early 12th century CE. As we will hear, Catherine approaches the subject via the concept of kinetic empire, a concept that was developed for the 18th and early 19th century North America, and which suggests that mobility was integral to the operation of state power. Catherine will be unpicking this concept for us and exploring how and if it can work in the medieval context. Catherine, over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, to Emma and to everybody at the Royal Historical Society for giving me the opportunity to give this talk this evening and to explore some ideas which have been at the back of my mind um, for some time. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in to listen uh, this evening. Um, I realize it's Friday evening and many of you will have much better things to be doing with your time. So thank you very much. So. Um, in recent years, I've spent quite a lot of time, as Emma has already suggested, in thinking about whether it's possible to engage in global history as a medieval historian. And if it is possible, about whether defining the characteristics of the global in the medieval world means dealing with the same sorts of concepts as those that we might define as global in other periods of history, or whether we're dealing with a kind of unique set of criteria for the Middle Ages. Now this evening, um, I want to focus on a broad concept which current suge research suggests has traction for global history of all periods, including the medieval world, and that concept is mobility. More specifically, I want to think about the ways in which mobility has been investigated in one relatively modern historical and geographical context, and think about what kind of implications that has for the study of another region in a more remote period of history. In the case I want to put to you, I'm going to break down the concept of mobility, conscious that one of the biggest criticisms that might be made of the practice of global history is that it's too reliant on broad brush concepts, which can be so capacious that they end up having little explanatory power. Now, I'm not sure if I entirely agree with that criticism, but nonetheless, as Christopher Atwood has suggested for the 13th century Mongols, in the case of a category like mobility, we need to be alert to different shades and forms. So for Atwood, the mobility of Mongol rulers, measured in terms of their seasonal itineracy, the size of their camps and the routes that they followed, seems to have been rather different to the seasonal migrations of the pastoralists from whom they first emerged as rulers in Inner Asia. So in this lecture, in the spirit of breaking down mobility, I'm not going to be concerned with the concept in general terms, but will instead focus on one particular facet 
the way in which trans and super regional power could be created, expressed and enforced through mobility, a facet of mobility that I'll refer to as kinetic empire. Now in discussing kinetic empire, I'm picking up on ideas and terminology developed by Pekka Himalainen in his examination of the indigenous Comanche empire in the American Southwest in the 18th and 19th centuries. For Himalainen, the Comanche empire was a kinetic empire in the sense that the nomadic society he discussed was a power regime which revolved around, and I'm quoting him, a set of mobile activities, long distance raiding, seasonal expansions, transnational diplomatic missions, semi-permanent trade fairs, recurring political assemblies, and control over shifting economic nodes. Now, I'm not going to argue that all the principles and structures that Homolinen identifies were seen in the medieval contexts I want to explore. To argue that would be unhelpfully reductive. Instead, in elaborating what was kinetic about my medieval examples, I want to develop two broad points which Himalayanen has made in his work on the Comanche. That thinking about kinetic power allows us to expand the ways in which empire as a diachronic historical category is conceptualized. And that secondly, thinking about empire in Himalayanen's terms in an expanded and more elastic form can allow us to gain more analytical precision. And in this sense of expanding categories in order to gain more analytical precision, I'm going to argue that distilling out evidence for kinetic empire in a particular medieval context has the potential to shed new light on a period and on a place which have long been accepted as a crucial watershed in the history of Western Eurasia, the Eastern Mediterranean world of the late 11th century. The argument which is usually made about this region between 1050 and 1100 is one of dramatic geopolitical transformation, as two sedentary empires, Byzantium with its capital in Constantinople and the Fatimid Caliphate based in Cairo, suddenly came under intense pressure from a variety of highly mobile newcomers. Those from the West, whom in an extremely clumsy way I'm going to label Normans, fortified later by Crusaders, and those from the East that I'm labeling Turks. But I want to stress that these are very general labels of convenience under which nestled an enormous variety of different groups. Although neither sedentary empire, neither Byzantium nor the Fatimids was entirely unseated by these newcomers in the late 11th century. Nonetheless, it has been argued that the military and political weather was irrevocably changed by the presence of these mobile incomers. And one could suggest that over the next century or so, from roughly 1100 to 1200, these long established centralized empires with their carefully curated ceremonial centers at Constantinople and at Cairo would either be destroyed or taken over by rulers whose political culture derived much from the warlord migrants of the late 11th century. Whether in the case of someone like Saladin who dismantled the Fatimid Caliphate in the late 1160s, early 1170s, or the Fourth Crusaders who sacked Constantinople in 1204. Now, clearly, that chronological and typological um, sketch I've just given is hugely oversimplified. And the extent of the transformation wrought by the Normans, the Crusaders and the Turks can obviously be nuanced. And in recent years, many individual studies have demonstrated the ways in which these incoming peoples, and the regimes that they established, actively borrowed from the political cultures of the empires they either replaced or rivaled. But this evening, I don't want to focus on how the political culture of the incomers with kinetic power was tamed or given a legitimizing gloss. Instead, I want to think about the period before the Normans, the Crusaders and the Turks became so apparent and so destabilizing. And above all, to think about the ways in which the kinetic was already an integral ingredient in the exercise and the creation of power in this region before 1050 a period when both Byzantium and the Fatimid empires were not weakening and contracting, but were apparently stable and even expanding. This was partly because some of the newcomer kinetic peoples and practices so visible after 1050 were already present in the Eastern Mediterranean, or to put it another way, the Eastern Mediterranean region was becoming increasingly locked into a series of wider geographies through kinetic peoples and their goods uh, and the ways they were traveling, 
But the argument I want to really advance is not simply that there were more kinetic newcomers of different sorts in this region in the 10th and 11th centuries, but something slightly different, that the creation and the sustenance and the communication of power by the so-called sedentary empires already depended on a mobility that we can call kinetic. The crucial point then is that by the 10th century, it was the so-called sedentary empires themselves which were demonstrating kinetic attributes rather than the more obviously kinetic newcomers. Now, before I go any further, um, I should apologize because the case I'm gonna present is very impressionistic. Uh, there's been a year of lockdowns, periods of remote teaching, homeschooling, and I've not done enough writing or research to be able to pin absolutely everything together. And there are lots of omissions. Some of what I'm gonna say may not be very new. And I know that I've missed hugely important parts of crucial bibliography in a variety of fields including, embarrassingly enough, my own field of Byzantine history and the ever burgeoning fields, which I think are going to be very relevant to this argument, the relevant fields of environment and climate history. So um, to think more specifically just about Byzantium for a moment, I'm conscious that I'm far from the first to invoke mobility in relationship to the governance of the Byzantine Empire. In an article published in 2018, Monica White commented extensively on the ways in which predictable movement was built into the structures and the operation of provincial armies in Byzantium in the later seventh to mid 10th centuries, particularly in the routine practice of mustering and reviewing troops at fixed gathering points, a practice which inevitably required individual soldiers known as stratioti in Byzantium to travel. And of course, there are many other Byzantinists who've invoked movement in their analyses of the empire. For instance, the rolling waves of provincials regularly going to seek their political fortunes in Constantinople, as depicted by Anthony Caldellis. Implicit in work done on Byzantine letter writing by scholars such as Margaret Mullet, and in research by Cécile Morisson, Jean-Claude Chenet, and Peter Frankopan on the lead seals with which those letters were authenticated, is a strong sense that long distance communication of information across the empire was integral to the sociability of a governing elite and by extension, as Jonas Nielsen has shown in a recent doctoral dissertation, even to the political culture of that elite. So in these senses, there are all sorts of ways that one could explore mobility in relationship to the operation of power, particularly in Byzantium. But what I want to stress this evening are some other aspects of the kinetic, which don't rely on traditional and routine forms of movement and communication. Instead, what I'm interested in is how the kinetic was expressed and utilized in the expansion of empire in the Eastern Mediterranean in the 10th and 11th centuries. And I'm gonna focus mainly on Byzantium, partly because this is the case I know best, but also because my time to look further afield in recent months has been so limited. But I am gonna reflect from time to time on the Fatimids, whose imperial beginnings in 10th century North Africa relied very extensively on various forms of mobility, particularly naval raiding, before the regime eventually migrated to Egypt in 969 with the ambition, ultimately unrealized, of moving on to Baghdad. And I should of course stress that in invoking the kinetic, I'm not trying to suggest that the kinetic was all that there was. I'm not trying to suggest that the expansion and consolidation of imperial power in either Byzantium or the Fatimid world owed nothing to sedentary modes of governance. So things like the collection of taxes by an imperial bureaucracy from an agrarian peasantry was important, as was the use of taxation to pay mercenaries in the army, or the use of written records to govern the distribution and allocation of resources. All these aspects of power mattered. But what I want to suggest is that these modes existed in a complex relationship with the kinetic, and that the presence and importance of the kinetic is something that we can all too easily overlook. In Byzantium's case, the main reason why the kinetic has often been overlooked is relatively easy to explain in the sense that the imperial expansion of the 10th and early 11th centuries has usually been analyzed in terms of the control, the acquisition and the exploitation of territory with attention strongly focused on administrative sources. So sources like handbooks of various sorts and lead seals, which are produced in Constantinople and which have been indexed to the creation and management of territorial divisions. Historians of the evolution of the Byzantine frontier differ in their sense of how intensively this administrative imprimatur was applied in practice in the areas of expansion, with some arguing for an intense rollout of a centralized military administration and others suggesting more devolution to local agents. But what both approaches have in common 
is the degree to which they interpret the exercise of power in terms of the sedentary state, in terms of the organizational logic of Constantinopolitan based bureaucrats, or at least in terms of what modern historians think that logic really was. But to adopt this approach overlooks a number of aspects of the extension and application of Byzantine governance, which can be equated with empire building, but which weren't necessarily about the permanent control and the direct imposition of an administrative machinery of the sedentary state. This is in a sense where I coincide with some of Hamer Linen's points. Many of the aspects of uh, Byzantium's empire were kinetic and tend to be visible more in narrative sources than in administrative ones, especially the narrative sources written by those at the receiving end of Byzantium's kinetic power. Now, one of the most striking aspects of the Byzantine kinetic was the empire's propensity for engaging in long distance campaigns, which seemed to have had very little to do with new military bases or new settlements, but were instead about making hitherto distant, even invisible imperial power suddenly very present, either by resorting to unexpected and extreme violence in the shape of punitive raiding, or by conducting something akin to an imperial triumph which enabled emperors or their commanders to engage in ceremonies of subjugation. Thus, we may think of the land raids against the Islamic Emirates of Devin in Armenia in the 920s. And on this not super good map, Devin is um, sort of on the right hand side of the map as you're looking at it. And similar raids against Edessa in the early 940s, Edessa not on the map, but somewhat to the south of Melitini or on the left hand side of the map. In the case of the raid against Devin, the Byzantines took with them shock technology in the shape of Greek fire, which could blast out of handheld devices, but there was no attempt to actually occupy the emirate at all. Even those military emperors of the third quarter of the 10th century, who I'm gonna come back to from time to time in this talk, who certainly took some interest in permanent territorial occupation or the creation of frontier client states, still used a lot of raiding as the means to that objective and also conducted long distance raids beyond the frontiers, which had very little territorial ambition, as in the attack on Damascus, Syria in 975 by the emperor John Zemiskis, which resulted in a one-off tribute payment. Um, Zemiskis is um, riding a horse in the image on the right-hand side, which comes from a fresco in a rock cut church in central Anatolia at Chavishin in Cappadocia. He and his associates um, are leading a bunch of um, soldier martyrs uh, in this church. So Zemiskis, I don't think, is always interested necessarily in landed acquisition. It's more about tribute, at least in the case of raiding Damascus. Nor does advancing territorial control seem to have been the principal concern of any of the big Eastern campaigns conducted by Zemiskis' successor, the Emperor Basil II, uh, with whom I probably spent too much of my life, really. In the first of his Eastern campaigns in 995, Basil crossed Anatolia in a little over two weeks. Normally it would take about two months. On this occasion, it took two weeks, appearing unexpectedly in Northern Syria at the start of spring with the ambition of scaring off a Fatimid army, which was threatening the Byzantine site at Antioch. A second Imperial raid in 999, provoked by Fatimid attack, entailed the emperor raiding down the coast of Syria as far as Tripoli and Beirut, um, which are obviously at the bottom right hand corner of the map here. He withdrew for the winter to the plains of Cilicia around Tarsus and then unexpectedly changed direction to put in an appearance back in the Armenian borderlands at Tau, where a local ruler had recently died, leaving Basil as his heir. But what's striking about this 999-1000 episode is how little territory was permanently occupied. Most of Basil's energies went into raiding and then after a long tour of the frontier region, um, he was um, accepting the subjugation of local Muslim and Christian rulers who were given salaries and titles. And then he went back to Constantinople and he didn't go east again for another 20 years. When he did go east in 1021, this was a longer campaign, one of purpose of which was to finally secure his legacy in a place called Tau, which is slap bang in the middle of this map. But even then, many aspects of his campaign resembled a raid rather than a planned territorial conquest. We're told that contemporaries were taken by surprise, in fact, when he chose to march to Tau. They expected him to go to Syria. And once he got to Tau, he occupied a few fortresses briefly, didn't tarry, and then kept on marching as far east in Lake 
as Lake Urmia in Azerbaijan, which is the lake without a title on your map. Now, in some ways, one could argue that Basil's raids in the east were so infrequent that to justify identifying them as kinetic empire doesn't really make sense. And you could argue that it was, in fact, Bulgaria, which interested Basil, the Bulgar slayer, the most, and where he worked in a much more consistent way to advance his empire. Until in 1018, the Byzantines were able to absorb the Bulgarian state. Now, the state of the evidence doesn't really allow us to say all that much, in fact, about how warfare was conducted in Bulgaria. Although it's likely that small scale campaigns to take particular forts may have been the bread and butter of the fighting, not exactly kinetic empire, not exactly kinetic warfare. But even so, in this context, the kinetic in the shape of long distance raids still seems to have played a role. As in 1002, when Basil marched up uh, to the Middle Danube, to the site of Divin, uh, Vidin, and then turned southwards and raided deep within the territory of his Bulgarian rival Samuel, in the region of the Macedonian lakes. So on this map, the area again, slap bang in the middle around Okrid and Prespa. Even after the rather mysterious Bulgarian capitulation to Byzantium in 1018, and we don't really know quite why the Bulgarians uh, surrendered to Byzantium in that year, the surrenders themselves of royal princes and local commanders were taken very publicly in a mobile grand tour of the Balkans which included a stopover in Okrid to seize the gold from Tsar Samuel's stores and culminated in an imperial entry back in Byzantine held territory in Athens. And there are other aspects of Byzantium's long-term military engagement with the Balkans, which certainly evoke the kinetic. So it's possible that when Basil II struck a trade deal with Venice in 992, that was partly about gaining a naval ally who might present the Bulgarian rulers with problems in the Adriatic, more raids. We also know that other neighbours with access to ship power were regarded as useful allies by the Byzantines. Above all, the Rus from settlements like Kiev on the Dnieper, whose troops took part in Byzantine campaigns as far west as Italy and as far east as Georgia and Syria, and whose naval expertise specifically was integral to a very big campaign against Crete in 949. One example of a campaign where territorial reconquest may have been the expectation. But Crete may be the exception which proves the rule, for there were many other engagements involving Byzantine kinetic power at sea, where the principal objective seems to be in a display of the imperial forces raw power and resources, rather than any kind of territorial occupation. Someone can think about attacks on Muslim enclaves near Rome in 915 or at Fraxinatum near Marseille in 941. Perhaps most intriguing of all in this regard is the expedition of 935, which was sent to Italy, when imperial officials carried with them a lot of portable wealth, above all silk, to persuade local allies to fight on their behalf, while also sending a small detachment of elite troops from as far away as Rus and Central Asia to impress the locals with the Byzantines' access to specialist and exotic manpower. Another aspect of Byzantine military endeavor, which seems akin to kinetic empire, is revealed when we think about what the Byzantines were actually looking for. In short, when we realize how important were movable goods and peoples to the Byzantines, as well as the places, or in Pekka Hemelinen's terms, the nodes, where goods and people could be transacted. Thus the main result of the raid against Edessa in 944 wasn't control of territory, but was instead the acquisition of a relic come icon, the face of Christ handkerchief known as the Mandilion. This was just one of many different relics which were taken back to Constantinople during the mid to later 11th century, uh, 10th century. One purpose to taking all this sacred capital back to the capital may have been to increase the spiritual arsenal which protected the emperor, the palace and the capital city itself. But interestingly, some of this sacred capital could itself become kinetic. So for example, uh, the Mandilion, the one taken from Edessa, was actually then taken back out onto the frontiers by Basil II in his campaigns against the Georgians. We also know that holy water extracted by contact with relics in the capital was taken from Constantinople to bless troops before their long distance campaigns. And meanwhile, as Jonathan Shepherd has shown in many different contexts, relics exported from Constantinople were a tried and tested means by which to attract the loyalty and the service of peoples and rulers on the emperor's, emper, empire's periphery and well beyond, including during the period of the First Crusade, which comes at the very end of the 11th century. 
And of course, it wasn't just sacred goods which could move, but also the people to create and interpret the sacred. So in the 10th and 11th centuries, we see striking evidence for the circulation of Byzantine craftsmen sent to important political centers well beyond the empire. So what I'm showing you here are some mosaics in Kiev and in Venice in church sites, but also in Cordoba, um, in, in the Great Mosque at Cordoba, which were um, decorated by Byzantine mosaicists. But while the mobilization and the transfer of the sacred was integral to the conduct of military campaigns and the sealing of political alliances, I think we also need to think about more mundane circulation as an integral part of Byzantium's kinetic empire. For what narratives of the Byzantines campaign stress most frequently is the Imperial Army's acquisition of booty, prisoners of war and slaves. When the mid 10th century Emperor Constantine VII was exhorting his troops, for instance, he invoked the model of one Basil Hexamilites, a naval commander who raided deep within the frontier emirate of Tarsus down in southwest modern day Turkey. The emperor reminded his audience not of the fact that Hexamilites had gained territory, but of the huge number of Tarsiates that were taken prisoner. And half a century later, during Basil II's last great Eastern campaign of the 1020s, the imperial armies wintered at Trebizond, modern day Trabzon, on the Black Sea, which was a noted ent entrepot where many prisoners of war were sold as slaves, prisoners who were almost certainly fellow Christians. Now the capture and the sale and the ransoming of captives, many of whom must have been women, is evidence for the very tangible impact that kinetic empire could have on contemporaries who suddenly found themselves in the path of the highly mobile Byzantine armies. But integral to kinetic empire in the Byzantine case was also an element of the intangible, an elusive quality, which was nonetheless rooted in real world events and had real world consequences. And what I have in mind here is the degree to which Byzantium's practice of kinetic empire relied on the creation and the transmission of stories about the empire and its powers. Now, when historians normally focus on Byzantium as a place of stories for wider consumption, it's usually on tales generated by the luxuries and the improbabilities of the imperial court in Constantinople, or about the sacred complexes of the imperial city. So probably the most famous image that you can put up as a Byzantinist, the Church of Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom, subsequently became a mosque after the Ottoman conquest. Um, the most sacred complex really within the Byzantine Empire in the middle of Constantinople, which famously left visitors unsure of whether they were in heaven or earth, or at least that's what we're told in the Rus Primary Chronicle, that the Russians visiting Constantinople and being taken to see the church didn't know whether they were in heaven or earth. I thought this was quite a nice image of um, some Muslim um, envoys from the Emirates of Melitini and Tarsus in the 10th century being taken into the church and being shown the mysteries of the holy vessels of Hagia Sophia. In a sense, what's going on here are stories about a sacred and a stable center, which the Byzantines wished the outside world to see as a conduit between the, the mundane and the supernatural. So these stories about Constantinople and about the sacred sites that one could visit there undoubtedly um, are important and circulate around the medieval world. And in that sense, they are themselves kinetic. But they're not the only stories which circulate about the Byzantines. Just as relevant in the period of imperial expansion were stories of military action and brutality. Thus, in some 11th century Byzantine histories, there are traces of frontier epics which pick up on the training for and the practice of a raiding style of cavalry warfare. In the early 12th century, some of this epic oral material was written up more fully in the shape of a narrative which we call Degena Secretis, a tale which was famous for its evocation of a world of close Christian Muslim relations, hyper masculinity, and predatory bride snatching. Now, it's sometimes been suggested that the world reflected in Degenis was far from that of the imperial court in Constantinople, and as much as anything, a rejection of imperial values by the rough and rugged world of the frontier. But even if that is the case, we shouldn't overlook the way in which imperial forces could create their own very powerful stories when campaigning on the frontiers or well beyond them. 
stories which were borne by the mutilated bodies of the conquered, including in the reign of Basil II, not just blinded Bulgarians, an incident for which he's particularly uh, famous or infamous, but also blinded Christian Georgians and mutilated Arab Bedouin. Now this evidence is complex because just as the Byzantines were capable of extreme physical violence, they also sought quite actively to encourage conquered populations into administrative arrangements in which local agents were actively involved in imperial government. So these were nuanced arrangements in which some didn't run from imperial power, but actively sought to engage with it. Nonetheless, while there was an undoubted reciprocity to governance in areas where the Byzantines claimed imperial control, the role that violence, or at least the threat of violence, played should not be overlooked. That the Byzantines were fully aware of the power of the stories that could circulate um, is also revealed by the Byzantines themselves. And I'm thinking here of the letters of the Emperor Constantine VII from the middle of the 10th century, who exhorted his forces to military action precisely so that those outside the empire would hear stories of the army's achievement. So I'm just going to quote from one of his letters. Let your heroic deeds be spoken of in foreign lands. Let the foreign contingents accompanying you be amazed at your discipline. Let them be messengers to their compatriots of your triumphs and your symbols which bring victory so that they may see the deeds you have performed. One example of the passage of such information to external audiences may come in a moment in 968 when Ludprand of Cremona, an Italian bishop and an envoy of the German emperor Otto I informed his master Otto that the new soldier emperor, like if focus, was known to locals as the pale death of the Saracens. One imagines that this news lent an additional frisson to the message that Nikiphorus had told Ludprand to convey to Otto, that if the German emperor continued to annoy the Byzantines in southern Italy with his own raids, then he would be smashed like, quote, an earthenware pot. Now, of course, there's always the question of what was style and what was substance. And we have a letter from the soldier emperor John Zemisky, is the one who was in the fresco a moment ago, a letter sent to some Armenian princes, where he claimed he didn't raid just down to Damascus in 975, but all the way to Jerusalem. And that was clearly a far-fetched claim because that didn't seem to happen. But that the kinesis of Byzantine imperial forces wasn't just all empty rhetoric is made clear by the fact that stories about the brutality of Byzantine raids from the period of expansion continued to circulate in the East when the Crusaders arrived in the same region nearly a century later. The explicit imperial memorialization of stories of brutality, or at least of the physicality of victory, were also clearly cultivated by the Byzantines themselves. In his Balkan Grand Tour of 1018, when he took the surrender of the Bulgarians, Basil II stopped off uh, near Simopoli to see a heap of bones where the Byzantines had won a huge and slightly unexpected victory against the Bulgarians more than 20 years earlier. In this sense, the Byzantines' military activity, both in practice and in memorialization, seems to constitute something which I'm going to call the dark matter of kinetic empire, which is a phrase taken from Haemolinen. In other words, a sense of empire which was simultaneously intangible and yet also residually powerful. And in this case, a sense of empire strikingly far away from what we customarily regard as its epicenter in the palace and the city of Constantinople itself. Well, if there is anything in this case that there was a strong kinetic dimension to the 10th and 11th century Byzantine empire, I guess the question is how far do you want to take the idea? Well, there are several possible answers, but I'm going to focus on two in this part of the lecture, and both are connected to issues of control. First of all, how could those who claim imperial hegemony control the kinetic elements which help to create their power? Now here I would suggest that while the kinetic could be a potent force for extending the reputational reach of Byzantium, it was something that wasn't always easy to control at the level of domestic politics. This is most visible when we think about the increasing frequency with which Byzantine armed forces became integral during the 10th and the 11th centuries to the politics of the imperial city of Constantinople. In other words, as many scholars have recognized, this is not a point unique to me, an increasing danger to the Byzantine body politic of the 10th and 11th centuries was the powerful general who could turn a kinetic army back away from the frontier region to march on Constantinople itself. <laughs> 
And I'm giving you one example here of a general called Barda Skleros, who presented a very substantial problem uh, for the Emperor Basil II in the first 10 years of his reign. A little earlier, Constantine VII, the mid 10th century armchair kind of emperor, who'd been brought to the throne with military backing, betrays a lot of anxiety in the letters that he sends to his troops about his own ability to control their activities. So he's brought to power by the, by the soldiers, uh, but he's not a soldier himself. So when he writes to his troops, he says, well, one solution is that he's gonna join the army. However, not yet. In the meantime, he's gonna send some dignitaries who are gonna write down the deeds of those who will be deserving of reward. But one wonders whether a predominantly sedentary empire solution to a kinetic empire problem was ever likely to work. Was it really possible for emperors to control armies through the power of letters and through the power of writing down the deeds of the soldiers who'd behaved uh, well and responsibly? We can see this in another case when, despite a great deal of legislation connected to the financing and organization of the Byzantine army in the 10th century, we've got heaps of evidence uh, for how that happened in theory, it's clear from legislation concerned with the retention of Armenian light cavalry troops that it was actually quite difficult to control troops by bureaucratic means from the Constantinopolitan center. In other words, they couldn't stop Armenian troops running away um, from the army. Now, if command from the imperial center didn't have much purchase on real world reality, if you can't do it through bureaucratic means, an alternative option for those running the empire was to become more peripatetic themselves. And this was a solution adopted by the Emperor Basil II, who led his armies personally, as did the Emperor Alexius Komnenos, the emperor at the time of the First Crusade. Now, of course, personal leadership of the Kinetic was not the only solution, and it wasn't the one adopted by all emperors in the 11th century. So we need to be careful about overstating the phenomenon. And in fact, an astute 11th century observer of politics, someone called Kekav Menos, advised emperors that their principal objective should be to keep hold of power in Constantinople itself. And Kekav Menos's maxim, power resides in Constantinople, is one which underpins many modern historians' assumptions about how political culture in Byzantium operated. And of course, it is striking that most military coups were focused on getting hold of the administrative and ceremonial resources of the palace and the city. But even when thinking about the capital, it's possible we should think more about the kinetic. As Michael McCormack has pointed out, one of the most striking developments of the 10th century was the revival of the imperial triumph, something which could perhaps be interpreted as a way of both celebrating, but also attempting to control the kinetic genie that was inspiring the expansion of the empire. And this is the Emperor John Zemiskis, um, an illustration of him bringing uh, the ruler of Bulgaria, Boris, into an imperial triumph in Constantinople. Now, a second, and I think probably more significant aspect of the control of the kinetic, or rather the lack of control, was the fact that for most of the period I've been speaking about, Byzantium was just one of many political entities underwritten by kinetic power. Indeed, one of the things which has always struck me about Byzantium is just how similar many aspects of its military campaigns were to those of its neighbors, and just how many neighbors were also engaged in raiding. And for me, this kinetic commonality has been just as striking as the more sedentary military culture issues, which were often central to the study in my field. So for example, the study of the revival of interest in military handbooks in this period, that is very interesting, but it's also the case that Byzantium has a lot in common with neighboring cultures, including kinetic warfare. Now, an obvious point of kinetic comparison for this lecture are the Fatimids, who differed from the Byzantines in that it took them some time before they found a stable political center, with Cairo only becoming that after other sites in North Africa had been tried and then abandoned. But in other respects, many of the Fatimids' politico-military practices seem rather similar to the Byzantines, namely the cultivation of an elaborate ceremonial culture in a fixed urban center. And the projection, though, of power from that center through the mechanism of long distance raiding. As early as 935, for instance, in the Fatimids case against the city of Genoa and the coast of southern France. Also similar to the Byzantines was the Fatimid threat of lending mobile military support, particularly maritime support, to their enemies' enemies. So in the early 11th, 10th century, the Byzantines were terrified by the prospect of their principal Bulgarian rival of that time being able to enlist Fatimid naval support. 
Now the Fatimids combination of elaborate ceremonial power and long distance raiding obviously has parallels elsewhere in the contemporary Islamic world, most obviously in the Umayyad Caliphate of Cordoba in Spain, which engaged very widely in very widely reported raids on sites in Christian Iberia, including the shrine of Santiago de Compostela. And in many ways, one could argue regular raiding had been a characteristic of the 10th and 9th century Abbasid Caliphate based in Baghdad before that began to implode in the 920s. And further north too, the Byzantines were accustomed to encountering those whose power was predicated on long distance kinetic activity, whether in the shape of the nomad Magyars, whose raids across Central Europe and into Italy were a striking feature of the 9th and early 10th centuries, or even the revived Western Empire under the Etonians of Saxony, whose power in Italy from the 950s onwards often took the form of dramatic and unexpected appearances in the peninsula with Otto II's raid in the 980s being just one resonant example for Byzantium. But of course, these are just some of the most well-known kinetic imperialist activities, but there are others whose exploitation of mobility was also integral to their power. Most obviously from a Byzantine perspective, steppe nomads such as the Pechenegs who operated north of the Black Sea and about whom the Byzantine client manual, the De Ministrando Imperio has a lot to say. And most famously, perhaps the Rus, Scandinavians, who by the 10th century were settling on the Dnieper River, but also those who are often dismissed merely as pirates or brigands or controllers of enclaves, but who in this period are probably best regarded as incipient kinetic states, like the Muslim held centers at Fraxinatum or Garigliano or Crete. Crete, before its conquest by Byzantium in 961, had indeed struck its own coinage. Perhaps another aspect of the interplay between the kinetic communication and power, which could be worth thinking about further. Well, I guess one could go on cataloguing parallel examples uh, for a long time, but the important question is what to make of the widespread incidence of kinetic in this period, especially the importance of raiding to the operation and projection of power. I guess the first implication is that anyone who tried to impress and express their power through kinetic means always had rivals who were doing the same thing and who might be more successful in enlisting the resources, including the human capital necessary for such activity. In writing to his armies, Constantine VII expresses paranoia about the ways in which a new raiding emirate in the east, the Hamdanids of Mosul and Aleppo, were using the tricks of the kinetic trade in regional warfare, spreading rumors about the mass movement of resources, men and money. Panic is very evident in his letters. So the legislation of Nikiphorus, the letter of John Zemiskis to the Armenians, the dispatch of relics to potential allies, demonstrates that Byzantine emperors, even in the military heyday of empire in the later 10th century, still needed to work hard to attract troops. Those who themselves had kinetic fighting skills and wouldn't necessarily come to serve Byzantium without inducements, or those that did could be attracted away by others with more on offer. Or as the Byzantines discovered to their cost, when they employed the Rus of Kiev to invade and destabilize Bulgaria in the late 1960s, hired kinetic force could become too successful. Having destroyed Bulgaria, the Rus ruler Sviatoslav elected not to go back up the Dnieper, but instead establish a new position on the Black Sea, very close to Constantinople. In a similar way, just as the Byzantines had rivals in the practice of building power through kinetic warfare, so too they could be the victims of that kind of martial culture being taken prisoner of war, and in some cases enslaved. We have a long narrative from the early 10th century by John Caminiates describing the sack of the city of Thessaloniki by someone called Leo of Tripoli, a letter which is written or an account which is written so that the author could be ransomed. But Leo's own route to power as a naval commander operating loosely under the caliphal power started as a Byzantine captive who was converted to Islam point about the multiplicity of those making power through kinetic means in the 10th and 11th century Mediterranean brings me to a final point about periodization. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, if we think about imperial power in the Eastern Mediterranean in this period, in terms of sedentary empires administered from fixed points with civil and military infrastructures and taxes paid for by an agrarian peasantry, well, the final decades of the 11th century look like a period of seismic change as the region comes under pressure from new and aggressive kinetic powers. The Seljuk Turks in the east 
who invade uh, Byzantine and Anatolia, but also Fatimid controlled regions in Syria. At this time in the late 11th century, the Byzantines faced new steppe nomads beyond the Danube, Pechenegs and Kumans, and they're facing the arrival in Italy of a new type of itinerant fighter looking for liquid assets, the Normans, some of whom later contribute to the Crusades. But if we think there was a strongly kinetic dimension to the exercise of regional power before all of these obviously kinetic groups arrived in great numbers, well, what then? Perhaps we could argue for an incrementalist case that Byzantium and the Fatimids were at heart sedentary empires, but ones which were able to absorb, channel, harness, even exploit the kinetic. As in the 1040s, when a group of Pechenegg steppe nomads were co-opted by the Byzantines, sometimes to raid back against other Pechenegg communities. Or we could think about the Varangians coming from Rus or from Scandinavia, who were employed as mercenaries in the Imperial Guard. Or in a dramatically souped up version of this account, crusaders who were funneled across the Bosphorus to help Byzantium gain territory lost to the Turks in Anatolia. This incrementalist account might fit with an approach to Byzantium recently taken by Antony Caldellus and his arguments that while Byzantium undoubtedly included some extra Byzantine forces, most soldiers and administrators were solidly domestic Byzantines. In this hybrid assessment, perhaps what happened across the 11th century was a shift in the balance of power, whereby what were initially controllable kinetic incomers gradually began to eat away at the fabric of the state which sustained them. Processes which one could argue had parallels in polities elsewhere. We could think of the gradual takeover of Lombard principalities in Italy by the Normans in this period, or possibly the reorientation of the Fatimid polity in the later 11th century by incomers of sorts like the Armenian Badra al-Jamali. However, there is a third possibility, which is that the kinetic, in the terms I've described it, was in fact an ever-present across the 10th and the 11th century Eastern Mediterranean world, a practice which characterized all the political cultures of all polities, not just the big imperial complexes, such as Byzantium and the Fatimids, or those that we've traditionally regarded as newcomers in the 11th century, like the Turks and the Normans. But instead, a variety of indigenous polities of all sizes, which were used to exercising and projecting power through raiding with the main purpose of those raids being about accessing and controlling key routes of communication and entrepôts, rather than extending control of territory and acquiring new tax revenues, about control of nodes and control of peoples. If there is anything in this idea, then rather than seeing the Eastern Mediterranean in terms of frontiers, like the map, many of the maps I've shown you this evening, or even in terms of a deep borderland area, we should instead think about a very jagged geography of interpenetration on both land and at sea, in which different polities raiders were frequently crisscrossing one another. Such a geopolitical environment might help to make sense of some rather bewildering and contradictory chronologies in the 11th century, particularly in Byzantium. What I'm thinking of here is there are times when the empire was supposed to be very secure, so the latter part of the reign of Basil II and the reign of his immediate successors, but we still find Rus and Arab raiding vessels appearing very, very close in the sea near Constantinople. Alternatively, in the middle of the 11th century, we're told that Turks are raiding very deep into central Anatolia, and you might assume the Byzantians, Byzantines were very weak, and yet they were still able to acquire new positions far to the east of these raids in eastern Anatolia. So a complex weave of raiding activity from multiple players may also help to explain why it's so difficult to track the arrival of genuine newcomers in the historical record. The first appearance of the Turks, for instance, in the Eastern regions of Byzantium is very difficult to date. If we didn't have a lot of Western sources and the rather uh, sui generis commentary of Anna Komnena, we might actually be tempted to view the arrival of the Crusaders in Northern Syria in the 1090s as simply the return of a raiding Byzantine army. Certainly the response from the contemporary Islamic world seems to have been to see the Crusaders in that traditionalist light. Now interpreting the Eastern Mediterranean world in the 10th and 11th centuries in terms of a tradition of raiding polities all crisscrossing each other may help to explain why when they arrived in bigger numbers the Normans, the Turks and the Crusaders were able to make such rapid progress when they did come. What that may mean in terms of periodization is that we should think less about distinct phases in the history of political change in the Eastern Mediterranean 
and much more about regional continuities across the 9th to the 13th centuries, especially in the vast majority of land and seascapes of the region beyond the imperial capitals and their long-standing core hinterlands. And in these senses, I'd suggest that the kinetic empire model proposed by Hemelinen has a lot of potential for forcing historians of the sedentary empires to loosen their traditional capital-centric gaze and expand as well as potentially contract what they mean by empire in this period and in this region of the medieval world. And if this is possible with regard to sedentary empires, as far as one region and one period goes, then perhaps it's an idea which is already being pursued elsewhere or could be pursued with regard to other periods and places. But as I finish, I just want to make one further point, which is there is a gigantic elephant in the room, in that while most of the polities I've talked about may have been kinetic, their rulers were not nomads. And most of those they claim to govern were not mobile pastoralists. So do these sorts of omissions mean that my approach to applying the kinetic to other kinds of peoples, polities and hegemonies is in fact falling into a classic global history trap of taking a concept and applying it so generally that it flattens and it homogenizes that which it's trying to explain, or perhaps worse, deflects attention back onto the usual imperial suspects while condemning to the sidelines precisely the kinds of hitherto marginal groups which an approach like kinetic empire was supposed to bring to the center. In finishing, I would argue against this charge. In the Eastern Mediterranean world of the period I've described tonight, thinking about kinetic dimensions to the so-called sedentary empires, I think allows us to see just how fluid and contingent were the politics and the polities of the 10th and 11th centuries despite intermittent attempts by those long-standing centers of imperial power to rebrand and reorder that fluidity in traditional administrative terms. The degree to which that reordering from imperial capitals was only ever a very partial part of a much wider and more fluid landscape of power is revealed by the ubiquity of the kinetic in the ways in which those empires themselves either chose or perhaps were forced to project and communicate their own claims to power and authority. So that's where I'm going to finish. Um, and thank you very much for those of you who are still listening. Um, um, I really appreciated the opportunity to, to think through some of these ideas about the kinetic. Brilliant. Catherine, thank you so much. What an absolutely fascinating uh, paper and intelligible to a modernist like me, which is a fantastic achievement. We, I've already seen some questions have um, turned up in the question and answer. So we've got two functions down at the bottom here. We've got Q&A and chat. And we're trying to encourage everybody to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, we're going to take a break. We'll, we'll stop just until um, seven o'clock on the dot, five minute break. There we go. Um, just so that we can organise ourselves and get the questions straight. And to give you time, we'd love to hear um, feedback. And I will put your questions to um, Catherine when we get back. So see you all in five minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, wonderful to have you all back. So we've got quite a few questions um, coming in. I'm going to um, read out some of these questions from the chat. I'm going to have to abbreviate a, uh, some of them a little bit, but Catherine herself um, has had a chance to read, so she'll have a, a sense of what we're, we're going to talk about. I'm going to start with the first question that we've got here from Iftikhar Malik. He says, um, could we say that the dominance of the Normans and Central Asian Turks rather decreased the erstwhile geopolitical centrality of the Mediterranean zones with implications for the Byzantium and the Fatimids? Um, there's a bit more that he's put there in the question there, um, Catherine, but I wonder if you'd be able to speak to that. Yes, so I think um, if to call it, 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 it is the idea actually in some respects it's the inside out of what I was saying so rather than everybody being drawn into the Mediterranean world if anything this kind of kinetic um, newcomers that I described them the Turks and the Normans is 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 actually deflecting attention away from the Mediterranean and then uh, individuals like Saladin kind of filling a vacuum is is that where your your question is 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 heading I think it's quite possible that uh, that actually I've you know 
I'm still re remaining pretty much in, located in the Mediterranean world and still seeing that in a centralized sort of way, even though I'm breaking it up um, and saying, well, let's not see Byzantium and the Fatimids as quite such centralized um, empires. Let's think about things in more cross-cutting sorts of ways. And yet, yeah, the unit, which I'm still thinking about is the Mediterranean, whereas the drift of your question is that there's, there's a gravitational pull in this period more towards, are we saying Northern Europe and, and then more towards Central Asia and uh, the, the Indian world. I, th I mean, I think that's possible. I'm not sure I know enough to be able to say with confidence. Um, yes. I think probably one of the, the things about periodization, I don't want to make any particularly grand claims for a, a wider medieval periodization, is that perhaps once you begin to um, use this kind of slightly more global history approach, which is predicated on movements going off in directions that you don't expect, then some of the standard changes to our periodization, which we tend to gauge in accordance with the rise and fall of empires that have previously been identified as important, many of those things begin to break up. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the, the destabilizing potential of this process for thinking about where the center of gravity of power lies in the, in the medieval world um, plausibly goes beyond the context which I was talking about. Uh, I'm not sure that's an adequate answer to what you're suggesting, but, but that's as much as I can give you at the moment. Thank you, Catherine. I'll move on to the next question we've got from Matthew Bennett. So he writes, in the light of what you said, would it be fair to say Anna Comines Alexia as an, see it as an explicit statement that her father had neutralised the kinetic threats from Normans, Hessian eggs, Turks, etc., in order to establish stability after a time of chaos? Um, I think you could interpret Anna in that way, whether you gauge that he has indeed really done that, I suppose is a bigger question. But, um, but yes, I think the way that the, the text is also constructed so that you have, you know, the, the stable empire as she would like to portray it being circled round about by all of these uh, kinetic forces. And yet Alexius somehow manages to keep that stable center um, in place and then create a little bit of stability in the first half of the 12th century. Um, I think probably what I'd want to do with Anna Komnena is actually go back and look at the text and see how many of the literary allusions and how much of the language of the Alexiad is actually uh, channeling um, kinetic phrases, kinetic motifs and so on. I think that would be a very interesting way, actually, of thinking about whether contemporaries saw things in this kind of way, or whether this is just an imposition on the part of a historian who's got a bit carried away with comparative and connective history. Lovely. In fact, I think the next question leads on really nicely from that. We've got an anonymous attendee here who is asking, could we extend the theory earlier, or to what extent could we do so? Um, Constantin II in the mid 17th century is said to be the first traveling Byzantine emperor. Is it more accurate to say there was an ebb and flow of kinetic nature of the empire? Do you believe it was increasing um, over the 11th century? Um, I think probably ebb and flow is quite uh, a good idea. Um, anyone in the audience who knows their Byzantine history very well will have noticed that I drew many of my examples really from the 10th century and the early 11th century. And there's a period between the 1030s and the 1050s, when one could argue that actually there is more of an attempt to centralize power and regularize things which had perhaps previously been in the shape of tribute payments and uh, long distance raiding and to try and um, uh, centralize. And maybe that was counterproductive in some cases. So the idea of ebb and flow, even in the period I was talking about, I think would be a plausible objection in some ways to the case I'm making. Um, but I think you could extend the theory earlier. Um, although I claim to know something about Byzantium, the earlier Byzantine period is not particularly the period I work on. But, um, but yes, there are moments, I think, when emperors are much more peripatetic. And maybe actually thinking about when emperors choose to do that is a signal that simply holding power in a Constantinopolitan center is not going to work sufficiently in the wider geopolitical context that the Byzantines find themselves in. Lovely, thank you. Um, Charles West next, he asks, is there any evidence for a shift in the spatial perception of Byzantine writers in this period, away from the empire as a territory towards a notion of the empire as a network? 
to match the gradually growing importance of the kinetic? Um, that's quite a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, in a way, partly what I was saying about Anna Komnena's Alexiad would be, you know, that would that would be now something I think to to go back and look at other texts with that eye. Um, I was casting my eye over the De Administrando Imperio um, the other day, which is the text written by Constantine Porphyrogenitus, the armchair emperor who sort of tries to control everything from the Constantinopolitan center. Um, there are some passages in that very, very rich text, which suggest actually that the Byzantines and even the Byzantine emperor who has a very orderly sedentary state um, approach to the world, is wrestling with uh, the world of raids, certainly in frontier regions. Um, and the, the chapters in question are those con concerned with the Transcaucasus with, with Armenia and Georgia. Um, so I think once you start to think that this might be a way of approaching Byzantium, then you begin to see some evidence for it, even in the text which you previously regarded as um, very much the uh, evidence of the sedentary empire. As I said in, in the lecture, which I may have skipped over too quickly, for me at the moment, I think it's most clear to see at least the concrete evidence for raiding activity coming out in narratives which are not written so much by the Byzantines, but by those they encounter. Um, but I, I certainly think it's something that one could look out for, and I'm sure there'll be people in the audience who can can come up with yes or no answers to that question. I'm not sure I can just yet. Thank you, Catherine. The questions are coming in thick and fast. So I'm going to ask this one, um, first of all, from Dr. B. Fort, and then I may take some of them as pairs. But this, I think, stands alone. It's where your concept of kinetic empire comes from. Does it owe anything to Robinson and Gallagher's famous centre and periphery trope used in relation to the British Empire in Africa? in the 19th and 20th centuries? Uh, not directly. Um, I think uh, as a historian, I've been uh, tried to think about how we think about empire in different ways at different times in thinking about Byzantium and different models have appealed to me at different times. I don't think I've consciously thought about kinetic empire in relationship to Robinson and Gallagher center periphery trope. Um, I think I'm going to be clumsy and say um, I probably have thought about empire in a centre periphery sense for most of my career. I'm not sure that I've done it in the in the sense that Robinson and Gallagher would would think of centre and periphery. Probably because uh, their model is is on a much much bigger scale. But um, I don't not sure that I'm on top of the detail enough to be able to say whether Byzantium in relationship to that model is one that um, I could particularly say much about. So I, I think the answer is no, um, but I will think about it more um, and um, I'll try and um, come up with a more coherent answer at a future date, because I, I, I don't think I'm going to give you an adequate answer to that question. I'm sorry. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. I don't think you need to apologise. I think we're all finding it absolutely fascinating and learning so much from everything that you're saying. Uh, our next person is Rosemary Morris, and she asks, given that Byzantine administrators were often moved quite frequently from post to post over large distances within the empire, would it not be possible to see this as evidence of a kinetic aspect of civilian government? And we could add the fact that administrators were often sent on specific mis missions, um, long distances through the empire. And I'll just follow up as well, um, with Patrick Lancher's um, question underneath, how does acknowledging the kinetic character of the Byzantine Empire change our views of cities in this region? So I think there are kind of really interesting questions there about um, aspects of government and about cities as well that you might pick something out of for us. Yes, I mean, I think these two questions touch on aspects as kinetic, which I didn't cover in the lecture. And I think probably what I was trying to do in the lecture was pick up some of the elements of um, the Hamerlinen model. And I haven't picked up all of them by any means. And I don't think all of them are true for Byzantium. Um, but trying perhaps to think about evidence where we can map Byzantium onto the Comanche model. And civilian administrators don't really fall into that category. But I would agree that if you're thinking about the kinetic in Byzantium, the fact that, well, to be a frank, civilian administrators who could still also be military men, so Byzantium having a tradition of salaried generals and salaried, salaried military officials, means that both civil and military um, administrators 
you know, classically do shuttle from one command to another. So the kind of rotational dimension of um, the administrative, of, of the bureaucracy in Byzantium is striking. Um, I think there are periods when that isn't always the case, but, but certainly if I think for the period I was dealing with, that is an aspect of the kinetic that one could, one could definitely integrate. Um, I, the question about how does it change our view of cities? I think one of the big areas, if I, if I were to write this lecture again and restart and realize that there was more to say than I thought there might be at the beginning, I think I'd want to talk more about um, the nodes, the places of transaction, which I kind of <laughs> fluttered over once or twice, but didn't make much of. So I think one of the things which is striking to me is that once you start to think in more kinetic terms, you start to think more about, or well, certainly settlements, and which are the most important settlements that different groups within this geopolitics are trying to, um, to access. Now, sometimes I think that is big cities. So Constantinople um, would be, would be a, a, a long-term player in this sense as a center of resources and a center of trade. And um, you know, the Byzantines, in some respects, have this, this golden attribute, um, which that's one of the reasons why they want to keep hold of it. But there are other sites which um, be suddenly become significant when you see them in that nodal sense. Um, and maybe some of the sort of classical cities where there's a big debate in Byzantine history about whether certain cities survive antiquity or not. Um, and once you start to think in these more kinetic terms, well, then maybe that question about survival from antiquity becomes less pressing. And what becomes more pressing is which sites were the most important at a contemporary point in time. Um, I mean, I'm, because the Dead Ministrando is in my head a lot at the moment, there is a site called Ardenutsin, which is referred to in um, that text, which seems to be a place where successive groups of or successive polities are trying to access because it stands um, on the crossroads of trade in the Eastern Black, Black Sea zone. And I don't really know actually how significant a site in terms of numbers of people it was, but it certainly seems a node that many different groups are trying to control. Um, one of the things in the Hemelinen case is that, um, that transactional places might be themselves mobile, as I remember. Um, that's something which I think I'd need to think about more in terms of, of Byzantium. So I think Patrick Bunchen's point about cities is a good one. Does it, does it force you to think more in terms of the cities as places of the redistribution allocation of resources rather necessarily always as ceremonial centers, which as a Byzantinist, I've often really privileged, I think. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Lewis Todd asks, well, he says, first of all, thank you for the insightful lecture um, here, here. The use of kinetic empire continues within this paper refers a lot to the projection of imperial power across the empire frontier and ter territories. Should kinetic empire be applied to Byzantium beyond the politics and authority of the emperor, perhaps to society more generally, such as the existence of relic hunting, supplying Constantinople with imported goods or sacred travel and pilgrimage? Um, and I, yeah, I'll leave you, I'll let you ask that one. The, the next question links on quite nicely as well. Why don't you have a think okay. about that? Um, I think the answer is yes, actually. And um, I chose to do this lecture in this way because um, I was interested in seeing whether Byzantium could be, or indeed the Eastern Mediterranean more generally, could have some light shed on it through the Himalayan and kind of lens. But more generally, in thinking about um, the potential of global history for thinking about the medieval world, um, I've become more interested, I suppose, in um, all aspects of mobility and exchange um, and the sort of cross-cuttingness that I was talking about at the end in relationship to raiding. I think you could talk about in the relationship to lots of different forms of movement um, across the Byzantine space. And actually, the more you think about that, um, the more you begin to recognize that those who actually want to hold power have to negotiate and engage with all of these other forms of, of, of movement. So as a political historian, I suppose what I come to be interested in is how those you know, determined to be hegemons are integrating with these other forms of movement. But I do think that this approach to thinking about power 
requires us to think a lot more about the kinds of things that you're mentioning in your question. Um, and if you're not interested in the building of power, and I imagine many historians really aren't, then actually thinking about these other kinds of kinetic behaviors in Byzantium um, would be uh, very interesting. And particularly if you're think interested in thinking about power in a more, um, I don't want to say second tier exactly, but but in more localized ways or in more informal ways, which don't necessarily always have to index back to the emperor. Um, I, I, I think there's lots of potential. Yes. Thank you. So uh, an expression of Radka Palova, she says, in, um, in regard to the last point of potentially marginalizing the mobile policies with this, which this concept of the kinetic is supposed to bring out, I would think there is perhaps a danger of fetishizing or overstating the exceptionality of their practices by not accounting for the broader picture bracket, which you do bring out really nicely in the paper, and that's misrepresenting them nonetheless. I'm thinking about the emphasis recently put on raiding and slave trade in building emergent polities of Bohemia or Hungary, which is supposed to gradually wane in the 11th century. Your paper suggests that perhaps they are not at all that exceptional and marginal as people seem to think. No, I think that's right. And I think somewhere um, in the back of my mind is, you know, quite a lot of work now which is being done on the degree to which the polarity of, if you like, nomad and settled is always much more blurred and potentially much more in the world of the imaginary than in the world of um, everyday um, existence. And I guess this really goes back to when I was a, was, was, was a doctoral student um, and I was trying to work out how the Byzantine Empire was governed during the reign of Basil II. Um, and it did require, you know, going through a lot of material which was designed to make me think about how particular bits of territory were governed. And I think some of that was, was, was fine and was justified. But, but every now and again, I'd come across things which would make me think, well, actually, Byzantium doesn't actually look very different from many, many of the neighboring polities. Um, so I think that um, it is a more of a characteristic of political life in this period to behave in this kind of way. Um, and so actually returning to nomads um, and leaving kinetic empire with a group of people who, you know, are marginal could then remain very marginal. So, so no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm with this spirit. Um, the article that I referred to early on in the talk by, um, which was co-written by Monica White, um, the other author is Naomi Standen. And I suppose one of the points that Naomi and Monica were keen to make, particularly at the beginning of the article, is that um, mobility is a structural feature of all sorts of polities in this period. And they don't talk particularly about things like slave, slaving and trading but are breaking down the differences between certain kind of hyper sedentary states and hyper mobile ones to show that there are an awful lot of shared practices. And much of, in their view, what happens is, is really um, adjustment to circumstance and what is expedient rather than necessarily thinking in, in hyper typological kind of ways. Thank you. Um, lovely question here from Rebecca Rist. She says, uh, you talked about the Hagia Sophia and relics in Byzantium. I was wondering if you could say a bit about pilgrimage as a form of kinetic movement within the empires you discussed. We tend to think about Western pilgrimage routes of this period, Normans, etc. But what about specifically Byzantine and Muslim pilgrimage to holy sites and their importance as ways of increasing communication and invoking power? Yeah, no, that is a good question. And I don't think I've got a very good answer. So. I mean, it's often said that, you know, pilgrimage in the Byzantine Empire, um, it, well, I don't know if it's often said, but but there's much less, um, is there less evidence? There's evidence for a lot of um, pilgrimage on the part of uh, monks. Um, there's some evidence, I think, for the part of the laity. We probably have fewer texts about which, uh, from which we can talk about pilgrimage. Um, so I, I think what I would say is because I'm not really a historian of pilgrimage, particularly in this period. It may be the question is, do we, is there less pilgrimage or is there simply less evidence of it? I think what is potentially quite striking, and it's not quite the point that Rebecca is asking me to address, but um, certainly by the 12th century, um, there are some shared 
saints cults between um, Byzantium and the Normans, for example, some of which center on a, a hub city, which is both a city, but also a trading place, Thessaloniki, um, which might suggest that at the very least, that kind of site, the site of St. Demetrius, is both a site of local pilgrimage, so there's kind of kinetic energy going into that site locally, as well as um, some kind of veneration of the saint um, from further afield. Um, so yes, there are there are local shrine sites. Whether there is the same sort of focus devotion from Byzantine, Byzantine people on wanting to go to Jerusalem and definitely wanting to be there in the way that those in the West um, in the 11th century have, have a, at least some do, have a magnetic um, draw to Jerusalem. Um, I mean, there are Byzantine pilgrims who go to Jerusalem by the 12th century. Um, Muslim pilgrimage, um, I think I know much less about for this period, and I don't really know very much about a later period. Um, I think it would be an interesting way to think about the kinetic, particularly in areas where there are sites which are shared. Um, so in the later medieval period, undoubtedly, there are sites in, um, in um, uh, Syria, Palestine, which are shared between different groups, and, I, and, and they must always have been shared, but where you can definitely chart pilgrims coming from many different areas of the Mediterranean and encountering each other at those sites. I, I don't know the evidence uh, or the degree to which that's truer in slightly earlier periods, um, but that would be another way of configuring um, how people engage with each other and how they relate to the sacred capital in the sense that I was talking about earlier. Sorry, that was not a very good answer. Um, but yes, something to follow up on. Very interesting. I'm going to take our next, uh, there's a couple of questions about the geography of what you're talking about that I'll put together. I think they're both really fascinating. So Claire Stancliffe asks, could you reflect on how your ideas of the kinetic interact with geographical features? For example, raiding is particularly well suited to the sea, a fluid medium, or to deserts and places with mobile populations, presumably work less on rich agricultural land, which are producing crops grown by peasants. And Chris Lewis also asks in a similar vein, he says something about the outer geographical limits of Byzantine kinetic power in this period. And were they only physical limits or psychological ones too? Uh, yeah, no, those are, are good questions. And I think that's one of the areas which, um, I mean, the paper doesn't pay any attention to, and it should do, and also areas on which there has been more recent research, um, particularly to do with the ecology of Anatolia, because there's a, a big debate about the degree to which pastoralism in Anatolia becomes a feature um, of uh, the latter part, certainly, of the period that I'm talking about, and with the impact of the Turks, something which means that areas of Anatolia which were previously um, sedentary agriculture then become um, zones for pastoralists and their flocks. Um, and I don't think um, I'm abreast enough on the precise research to really be able to say a great deal about that. Um, raiding activity by sea, I think, is um, an obvious point. And maybe um, and I used to sit in lectures given by Jonathan Shepherd, and in a way, much of this lecture and much of what I've said is sort of channeling those lectures from a long time ago, I think. But um, one of Jonathan's points always used to be that the Byzantines were able to um, have what I think he used to call listening posts in um, quite far flung areas because they could get there by sea and they could hang on to small little enclaves in, you know, north of the Black, in the north of the Black Sea or areas in even the Western Mediterranean at times. So I think the, the connectivity and the kinetic potential of the sea is one thing which allows Byzantium uh, to project its power more extensively through raiding. I think it's something which has probably been under, under studied in Byzantium in relationship to uh, land. Um, on land, um, there are clearly areas where it is easier to raid. Um, well, you've got to get through mountains to be able to raid certain places in um, the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm not sure that those mountains are always necessarily barriers. Sometimes they're definitely channels. Um, some of the value of the military manuals that I talked about 
is that they give you some insight in how the Byzantines both defended themselves against raids, but also thought about raiding uh, their enemies. Um, the Byzantines themselves are vulnerable to raids um, in, I think, particularly Eastern Anatolia. But geography doesn't always matter so much because some of the kind of zones in Anatolia, which were relatively unraided in the 11th century and had always been in some senses the hinterland to Constantinople and providing the capital city with certain resources, um, you know, are some of the areas where the Turkish um, presence becomes very established in the 12th century. So areas which one would have assumed would be more insulated suddenly become the epicenter of new political units and areas which look far more remote uh, still remain susceptible to Byzantine um, influence and power. So I'm not, this is slightly changing the question, I'm not sure necessarily the geography always dictates where the power can be projected. It might dictate to some extent the regularity of the raids, but, um, but some of the raids that I was talking about today, you've got to go through some pretty difficult terrain to get there, and sometimes you've got to have fallback places where you can spend the winter because if you get stuck on the wrong side of certain mountain ranges um, in the winter then that can be pretty disastrous so raiding itself may not be entirely risk-free which perhaps is something that i should have thought about um, a bit more um because the, the, the danger is that this suddenly becomes all about uh you know this is an easy form of projecting power but there are risks attached to it. So the point about um, about there was a psychological point, wasn't it? Is it just is it just physical or is it psychological? Um, yes, that's a very good question. Um, I think there are certain moments at which uh, uh, which you can see the Byzantines deciding that they don't want to go any further. Certainly they don't want to go any further with territorial acquisitions um, because of the dangers of taking on to what you can't control. So I think something I was talking about in the lecture, which is how do you control the kinetic, might be relevant to this point. So as I said, one option is to go, you know, lead the army yourself. Another option is to try and send bureaucrats to do it on your behalf or to try and find mechanisms to control the army. But the other problem is if you, if you are too successful as a raider and then you suddenly discover that you are having to take um, more direct control of somewhere that you've um, conquered, um, you've then got to potentially manage um, quite turbulent populations perhaps and so I think it is striking that while the Byzantines take control of a city like Antioch in the late 960s and then raid a near neighbor of Antioch, Aleppo, quite regularly, they never decide to try and conquer Aleppo directly. Um, and there are stories that Basil II stood outside Aleppo for a while and then decided that that wasn't worth doing. Um, so maybe it's the resources of the neighbors as much as the sort of um, the psyche of the Byzantines themselves, which can be dependent or at least play on the on, on the psychological um, framework of the Byzantines themselves. Thanks, Catherine. Well, we've just got a couple more questions. I'll just pick out a few points and then feel free to just start uh, respond to whatever um, appeals to you out of this um, last set of questions. So fascinating talks, Alton Biedemann says. Um, uh, his period of uh, Portuguese power in Asia just after 1500, lots of raiding and imposing tribute there. One thing that intrigues me is transitions from local rulers paying tributes to the imperial centre to the centre paying pensions to local rulers. So could you say something about that? And uh, from Peter Frankopan, if not being kinetic presented dangers for emperors and caliphs, why did so many remain in their capitals? Um, if mobile groups could mushroom up a period if by magic, could, should, would we expect them to come across, would we expect to come across them more often? A few thoughts there that you might like to pick on, Catherine, just to take a pick. <laughs> yeah, well, actually the last one first, if mobile groups could mushroom up and appear as if by magic, could we expect to come across them more often? Um, I think some of what I'm talking about might be two different things. So one th the most obvious thing, I think, is the more you look at the narratives that I was talking about, particularly those which come from the frontier regions of Byzantium, um, so the people that Byzantines are encountering in these long distance raids, and you read those narratives 
sort of cover to cover and not just looking for when the Byzantines happen to be raiding there. I think the more one realizes that raiding as an activity is something which is pretty ubiquitous. Um, and we often as Byzantinists, I think, skip over the bits in the text which talk about kind of this localized raiding as not really terribly significant for us. So I think raiding as an activity is something shared by a lot of different political societies. So to some extent, um, I'm not sure it is just mobile groups mushering or appearing as by magic. I think it's more of a kind of um, type of political behavior which is shared by lots of groups, some of whom might be mobile. And I think there are more mobile groups in the 11th century for you know, reasons that I tried to talk about in the lecture at the beginning. But I think a lot of this behavior is, is probably exhibited by those who are already there. And there are groups of people that I didn't talk about. And if I'd had more time to do the research for this paper, I'd have wanted to integrate a bit more. So in other words, people coming into particularly Islamic um, jurisdictions as soldiers from the Central Asian steppes, as converts, Turks who are then enlisted into the armies of various caliphal powers, but also local emirates who are themselves, um, well, mobile in the sense that they can be employed by different, by different groups. So I think, I think it's a mix, um, not necessarily um, one thing or the other. Um, so that possibly then relates to the question about local rulers playing tribute to the imperial center and the center paying pensions to local rulers. I think, again, it's probably quite a complex mix. Um, and what can sometimes appear to be a salary or a pension to a local ruler could in some ways actually be considered as a tribute payment from the imperial center out to the periphery. You know, and if that's true, well, maybe some of the things which we regard as tribute could potentially, I don't want to overplay this idea, but could potentially be um, uh, tribute being sent to Byzantium could in its sense, sense be a, a salary. I'm not suggesting the Byzantine emperors would necessarily pay salaries by local rulers, but, uh, but the, the playing field might be slightly more level or at least less hierarchical. We are very subject, I think Byzantium is a very, very unusual case in some respects, that some of the texts we have um, have a very hierocratic kind of principle behind them where the Byzantine emperor is giving out um, titles, materials, um, largesse to the surrounding world. Um, and we get sucked into that logic rather necessarily than seeing as these, some of these relationships as a little bit more bilateral. And a classic example would be some of the, the chatter in Byzantium about what gets given to Pechenegg nomads out on the steppe. And I've always regarded basically the Pechenegs as these kind of client peoples, rather in the terms that the Byzantines saw them. But actually, if you kind of recenter yourself and put yourself in the shoes of the Pechenegs, perhaps, um, and then see Byzantium as an occasional place that you can do deals with, um, maybe the relationship becomes a little bit more even. So I'm not sure that it's the case that sometimes um, tributes coming in and salaries are going out, and then at other points the, the, the centre is paying out salaries but, but not in return for tribute. I think it's probably um, a slightly more complicated kind of economy of, of wealth being exchanged. Um, and then the other question from, from Peter was, why did so many people stay in the centre? Um, well, first of all, I'm not entirely sure that they always do. Um, but I'd have to think about that. I mean, I guess there, there are ways of staying in the centre, but employing those who can project themselves outwards. So maybe in that sense, one of the um, one of the examples of that would be, as I understand it, and I don't really work on the Islamic world properly, um, caliphs originally would go out with armies on raid on raids, or at least on on um, holy war campaigns. But over time, that gets sort of um, outsourced to either the vizier or to um, commanders of different sorts to operate in the name of, um, of, of the caliph. And in some respects, actually going back to the thing that I worked on um, for most of my career until um, I finished writing a book on it, 
Basil II actually couldn't lead the army all the time. So he had to find other people who could do that for him, but operating very much as almost an alter ego. So again, I'm not sure that it's necessarily, maybe I overplayed this in the talk, it's necessarily the case that there were some emperors who were armchair emperors and stayed at home, and then there were some emperors who were constantly out in the field. Some emperors have that reputation that they're everywhere and constantly out in the field. But it is quite plausible that Basil II spent more time in Constantinople, but he just had to kind of create the impression that he would he could be everywhere at once. But again, that point about ebb and flow might be uh, the uh, most useful thing, that there are periods where it's more important for a ruler to be visible and to be itinerant. And then there are periods where it's more important, actually, maybe not even to be visible in the imperial center, but to be lo located there. I think the Normans in the Mediterranean, um, the Norman kingdom of Sicily would be quite an interesting test case uh, for how you could be sort of both invisible and yet present in a center um, in the way that the Norman power seems to change over the course of the 12th century. But that wasn't, that wasn't the best answer either. So um, yeah, they're coming from, from all sides. Thank you, Peter. I think that was an amazing answer, and I think it was an amazing paper, Catherine. Uh, I, I know we all say sometimes our oh, quality of the questions are really testimony to the paper, but I think it's really true in this case, the, the, the complexity of those questions um, and the variety and range of the thing, things that people have raised um, in the chat and in the questions there is really testimony to the wide ranging nature of the paper and how very, uh, very, very thought provoking it is. I'd love to say thank you on behalf of the Royal Society um, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Thank you very much to our audience coming and listening. I will just, um, before going out, just uh, plug our next lecture. We've got uh, Robert Frost uh, taking us staying in Europe, bringing us into the early modern period um, at our next lecture in July, The Road Not Taken, Liberty, Sovereignty and the Idea of the Republic, the Republic of Poland, Lithuania and the British Isles, 1550 to 1660. So that's coming up in early July. Um, do, do join us if you can. And thank you once again, Catherine, for a really fascinating and uh, just amazing paper. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye, everybody. You. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye.